Um, so I'm JF. I'm Chief Architect of, at Woven by Toyota. I also chair the evolution of the C++ programming language. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about safety and security, the future of C++. So uh, um, I was asked before the talk whether safety and security are the future of C++. I think they're an integral part of what the future of C++ needs to be. Otherwise, C++ will keep, keep existing, but it'll become less and less relevant. Right? And so, so really, um, I, what I think is that folks in the C++ community, not just the C++ committee, but the community at large, um, they're not on the same page as to what safety and security mean. Right? And so if I have a keynote on safety and security and I just say, let's have it, we, we can all agree, but we don't agree on what that means. And that's, that's a problem, right? I think that causes people to speak past each other when they talk about safety and security. And that then prevents us from making meaningful advancement in safety and security for C++. I think that's been a, a trend in many parts of C++, but that one in particular, I think, hasn't really advanced because of this, this, this misunderstanding of what things mean. Right? And it's not ill-intended, it's just like we have different values that we assign to things and we just talk past each other of it. Um, and so my thinking for this talk is it's okay to disagree on priorities, right? Different people have different priorities for what they would want to have in the language, uh, but we can't disagree on facts. I think most of us are a bit scientific-minded. If we all have the same facts and we say, oh, you have these priorities and I have those ones, then we can have a real conversation and kind of reconcile those things. Um, and so part of what I want to do is kind of set a baseline for what a framework for priorities might look like in terms of safety and security for C++ and try to justify why we want to have safety and security in C++. And so my goal today is to first get us on the same page, right? Have the same definitions of things when we talk about them and then, you know, figure out how to improve C++ based on those facts. Uh, I have non-goals, however, um, two non-goals actually. One of them is I don't want to do armchair philosophy, right? I'm not interested in debating the minute points of things or whatever else, nor am I interested in having devil's advocates, right? What I found is when we try to do this, we end up not doing anything. Now, we're, we're geeks and we tend to nitpick things and have fun doing it. Let's agree to do that at the bar, not at this session instead, right? Like the bar is a great place to have these nitpicky, like run down the rabbit hole type of thing. Um, but, but really my goal when people watch this talk on YouTube a year or two later and they see the actions that, come, that have come out since then is they don't think we nitpicked C++ uh, safety and security. That, that's really, it would be a failure in my opinion if that's what we end up doing. So with that introduction, let's get to it. I want to talk about safety and security in C++. So a lot of that framing that we have when uh, people on the internet talk about safety and security is this is an existential threat for C++. Is it? Yeah, I, I think so, right? But I don't think the threat itself is the most important aspect that we collectively should be talking about. Uh, because to me, C++ is just a tool. It's a thing you do stuff with, right? At the end of the day, it's a tool. It has flaws. We could remedy those flaws, some of them at least. But there are also other tools out there, and that's fine, right? I want to use the right tool for the job. C++ happens to be a decent tool for many jobs. There are other tools that are useful for those jobs as well. So my goal today is to discuss how we got to an existential threat and how I'm approaching this threat based on established safety critical industry experience. So that's my approach. And what our collective responsibility is now that we're here, now there is a threat, right? And I want to understand why it's a threat first. And if you've seen my talks before, I, I tend to have amusing talks. Uh, this talk it has some jokes, they're, they're kind of later. I'm going to start, start with stuff that's not amusing at all. And I, I'm very, very serious here. Next slide is not fun, right? And I, I want to preface this, very uncomfortable. Uh, so I'm, I want to do a show of hands here. Um, <clears throat> so who here in this room has written code that has killed someone? I have one set of hands, that's not a lot. And this is a tough question, right? It's not fun. There's no joke here, right? I, I mean this by unintentionally, right? If you write a, a, a crit, no, but, uh, it's, that's not a joke either, not a joke. There are people writing software for military applications and that is their intended purpose, right? I, I exclude that as part of my question. I mean, unintentionally. And it's not a hyperbole, right? Because I know people, I've asked this question in other rooms before and I've had discussions with colleagues before who have had that experience. They've written a bug, it got used in a zero day attack against particular people or whatever else, and they take that upon themselves. That's software, right? Now, imagine living with that knowledge, that's hard. Right? And 
the tricky thing is software is everywhere. And the more it is everywhere, the more that risks happening. That's a big, big, big danger. Right? So if you didn't raise your hand, think about what that would mean if you were in that situation. That's really difficult. Right? And, and software is written in programming languages, programming languages like C++. So I have a follow-on question for you. Right? Tell me, if you wrote that bug and something like this happened, is anyone else also sharing in your responsibility? For example, the programming language, the implementers of it. Uh, in the context of a zero-day exploit, if that was made responsible by the programming language making it easy to make that mistake that led to that zero-day exploit, who else is responsible? Right? That, that's tricky as, as a moral thinking. Like, try to let that in and think about what that actually means. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, <clears throat> the, the, the reason this has become a big thing in the C++ community is because there's been a lot of headlines recently around this general topic. And, and I'll go through a few of them, right? Uh, I think these criticisms I'm going to show you are informed by security professionals who are deeply familiar with how programming language and security can affect human life. Right, so the things I'm going to show you aren't just some like, random hit pieces that people put on the internet. I don't think so at all. Right? So here's an example. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, something put out by the NSA. And they say they release guidance on how to protect against software memory safety issues. Right? It's a whole report. I don't agree with all of it, but it has solid content. Right? And this spells out things about unsafe languages, such as C++. Here's another one. Uh, National Security Agency, again, has, uh, 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 with the Defense Department, another thing that they put out. And you know, right here, commonly used languages such as C++ provide a lot of freedom and flexibility in memory management, while relying heavily on the programmer to perform the needed checks on memory references. It calls out C++ explicitly. There's a Consumer Report article. And before you think and dismiss Consumer Report because you're like, that's not a vacuum cleaner. Like, C++ is not a vacuum cleaner. I don't care about Consumer Report. Consumer Report is actually extremely well informed. The person who wrote those, this report talked to a lot of experts and is herself very well informed in this field. And Consumer Report has done similar reports in the past in safety fields, not necessarily programming, but other fields of safety. So I don't want people to dismiss this just because it's Consumer Report and you think it's about vacuums or shoes or something. Here's another one. <clears throat> now, this is from Vice News, right? It, you might think it's more of a hit piece, but the fact that Vice News talks about C and C++ is kind of interesting, right? Like, the fact that it gets to more mainstream uh, publications is meaningful in itself. Here's another one. Uh, so, so this is from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And uh, it, it's fairly big, but they have a section 3.2 that says some languages, such as C and C++, are not memory safe. And they also say, where practical, use memory safe languages. So that's an explicit recommendation not to use C and C++ where practical. There is also uh, the Enigma conference, which is a fairly well-known security conference. Uh, they had a whole uh, panel about memory safety right, and talked explicitly about C and C++. <clears throat> the, the, um, the register, which like is more of a tech-oriented publication. I had an article about memory safety, is the new black fashionable and fit for any occasion? And then subtitle, calls to avoid CNC++ and embra embrace rust, grow louder. <clears throat> Here's another one. This was put out by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And they say secure by design, secure by default. Right? So how to design things in the at least US government infrastructure that is secure by design and by default. That's interesting. There's a section in it about memory safe programming languages. And there's, here's another one. Uh, this is something put out by uh, the same agency, shifting the balance of cybersecurity risk, principles, and approaches for security by design and by default. Right, so this is a collaboration referring to the other one. It's not just the US, there's Canada right there. I'm Canadian, hi. Um, and so this was a lot of headlines. And, and you know, when I talk about this with people in the committee and outside, their reaction is a bit like this. A lot of people think it's unfair, right? And this bunny thinks it's unfair as well. This is unfair criticism. And, and, and they're not ha the folks writing these articles aren't happy with the C++ language. Uh, they're not happy with the standards committee and the implementers because for a while now, these types of things have been written in less visible venues, right? They've been saying the same thing for a while in just less vis visible settings. It's not the NSA going and saying something like that. It was just kind of more 
uh, close settings. But they've been setting this message of danger to human life, and their impression is that the message has just not been landing. And their follow-on is to go at bigger and bigger podiums. Um, and many in the C++ community feel that it's unfair. If you read, for example, the uh, C++ paper uh, P2739, it, it thinks it's unfair. And it's because many of us in the committee have actually done things. We've taken steps as individuals to do things in the committee, have done certain steps and implementers as well. There has been good work. Uh, but as a collective body, not just a committee, but as an industry, uh, the impression is that we came up short, right? Like we've done stuff, but the folks criticizing us collectively still think that's not enough. And so I, I don't want to argue whether they're correct or not. Uh, it's, it's an impression. So let's take their perception as a given for now, right? Whether we agree or not. And I'll, I'll try to convince the, you in this talk that they are kind of right. Okay. And, and, and I want to be sure, fair also to the folks uh, uh, criticizing C++. What they perceive pretty often is that we, the C++ leadership, are often saying users are holding it wrong, right? Some of the public criticism when someone comes out and says C++ is unsafe or insecure or something like that is, well, that's because you're using it wrong, right? And so the perception from the outside is we are blaming the users. And that's fair. I've seen criticism of that shape, right? That wasn't the intent of the reaction, but this, the, the, that's the impact that the reaction has had. And, you know, I want people who aren't in the committee or the C++ implementers uh, uh, um, community to keep in mind that we're not like a hive mind that all think the same thing, right? We're a fragmented set of people with different priorities, different opinions, and, and the opinions have been changing over time, right? So, so it used to be quite a while ago that a lot of folks didn't really think about safety and security. And if you look at the, the list of talks submitted to C++ now this, just this year, there's a lot about safety and security, and I think none of them are saying safety and security are bad, right? Most of them are like trying to say, what does it mean? What do we do about it? And so I think there have been changing opinions, right? I want to be fair to, to uh, the committee and implementers. Uh, our thinking has collectively changed over time. Even though we're not a hive mind, I would say the average has shifted towards wanting to have safety and security. And some members have been talking about this for more than 10 years. That is very true. <clears throat> But the thing that's also true is that security problems are happening more and more. And modern languages such as Rust or Swift seem like a compelling option because they have fewer issues coming out of their use. Take that for granted, we'll look at why that is later. And so we all know the strengths of C++, at least in this room, but if we commit, continue as a committee and as implementers to create what seems to many as ad hoc solutions, to the security and safety threats, then at some point, the, the incremental benefits of C++ won't out, outweigh the costs of it. Right? So we've been doing things to try and improve safety and security as a committee, as implementers, but they tend to be tactical and not strategic fixes. And I think there's good reasons for why we don't really do strategy and try to have a, a, a common fix. We, we've done more tactical things. And that has advanced the state of security, but not that much or not enough. At this point, I'm going to quote Herb Sutter. Um, so Herb said this in a private mailing list. I asked him if I could post it in public, and he said yes, and offered me a great amount of feedback for the rest of the talk. So thank you, Herb. Uh, so he says, you know, many of us keep talking about our work as software engineering, uh, though really we work more as craftspeople. Aspiring to be accepted as doing real engineering is great, but also has a be careful what you wish for aspect, because really achieving that would include regulations. And, and that's a key point. When we talk about safety and security, we say, yeah, that seems to be a problem, but we so far haven't internalized what that means for us in our industry. What does it mean to deploy safety and security? It probably means that we need to be a bit more mature as a field. And I'll get into details of that in a bit. Now, I, I want to show you that, that through semi-scientific survey, that, that the impression of the committee, at least, has shifted in terms of safety and security. Um, I took a survey in November 2022 right, so la last year, asking what are the number one and number two most important priorities for C++'s future. And so in blue here, uh, and that, that was like 150 people who responded from the C++ committee. And in blue here is the number one priority, and in yellow is number two. And this is all the votes. And I tallied them as an open answer question. I didn't give them topics. They, they chose the topics, open field, and I, I bucketed all of those into uh, um, what people actually told me. Now, if you look back three, five, ten years, 
I didn't have these surveys, but I guarantee you that performance was probably towards the top, right? And ABI was probably towards the top as well. Um, now, maybe this is biased based on what the committee had been discussing recently. I did send out this survey after we had talked about safety and security. So maybe th that was like in the spur of the moment, people were like, oh yeah, safety and security, and now they've forgotten about it. I don't think so though. Um, and so, you know, I want to keep in mind that this here is representative of the, of the people I sampled in the committee at that point in time. It's not representative of the whole C++ community, but it's some amount of representation from people who have been working on C++ and trying to improve it, right? And so I, I think this offers interesting data, right? When we look at what do we think in the committee we should be advancing, uh, networking was one person, and that's a number two priority. Contracts was one person, and that's a number two priority. Reflection was one person as a number one priority, uh, and maybe three as a, a number two priority. Like, not a lot of people said performance even as the number one priority. Some people still think it, and, and I understand why. Again, when I talk about what should we do, we can all have the same facts, but weigh them differently. Th these are useful weights, right? Like, some people have code that has nothing to do with safety or security. They don't care about it. That is fine. I understand that they care about performance more. That's okay. <clears throat> All right, and I want to draw a parallel here because I think the, the, the feedback we're seeing about C and C++ and programming at large is very, very similar to the, the, the evolution of seat belts over time. And I mean like actual seat belts in cars. Um, and basically, the seat belts were invented a long time ago, 1800s. They were used like for, for cars and stuff like that, like race cars, uh, and started to being used a lot in the 1950s. A lot of, of races started saying like, you know, our drivers are kind of dying, so maybe they should all be mandated to have uh, uh, seat belts for sport car competitions. And then in 58, uh, the three-point seat belt was invented. And then in 68, uh, it was required in American vehicles. Those were required to have them in the car. And then between 68 and 93, different states passed different laws mandating that they be used, right? So you remember like the click it or ticket? That's, there's, there's still panels everywhere in the US with like click it or ticket or some other stuff like that. Uh, so mandating that people use them. And um, <clears throat> the seat belt, the, the modern three-point seat belt was actually made by Volvo, uh, made available uh, to other car manufacturers for free. Volvo invented this and said, give it away. Like, just use it. We, we, we have a patent, use it, it's free. And uh, it took a long time to adopt, right? But uh, the person who invented it, uh, uh, his name is Bolin, he died in September 20, uh, uh, 2002, right? So between 68 and 2002, he did this, he died afterwards, uh, not of a car crash as far as I know. Um, <laughs> and, and Volvo did an estimate when, when he died to estimate how many lives he had saved in four decades. How many do you think have seatbelts saved in four decades just in the US? I think it's worldwide, actually. Million lives. One million. So the question I had earlier, right? Imagine if you wrote a software bug and it killed one person, one. Imagine if you're that guy, you saved a million people. You have the chance to do this with programming. It'll be hard to estimate when, when you die. I'm sorry, you're all, you're all gonna die one day. Uh, It'll be hard to estimate how much you've advanced, but you can actually impact the world in a meaningful way. And the thing that's interesting about seatbelts is that it's unarguable that seatbelts got deployed because of the noise that was made by people about the danger of not having seatbelts and not wearing them. That caused pressure on the government to pass laws mandating seatbelts. And that noise that started from a few people caused legislation which moved the industry and the public perception which eventually saved lives. Right? So in this time scale comparable to this, the evolution of seat belts, where are programming languages today? I, I would say that we're not very far. Right? I think programming languages are still fairly immature and haven't reached the point where we can start saving a tremendous number of lives through that. Now, <clears throat> I want to do a show of hands here. Uh, who doesn't wear a seat belt in the car in this room? Anyone? No one, right? Now, let's contrast this. Nobody here doesn't wear, a, or does, wants to admit that they don't wear a seat belt in the car. Um, who here writes C or C++ code at CPP now? Pretty much everyone, right? 
someone's asleep there, not raising their hands. But besides that, everyone, right? So let's contrast it. Folks such as NIST and the NSA and so on, they're, they're now saying that programming in C++ and C is akin to not wearing a seatbelt, right? You might disagree on that, but the pushback on seatbelts in the early days is kind of like the situation we're in now, right? The pushback on seatbelts was, well, I'm a good driver and I don't need a seatbelt. Are you all good programmers? No. <laughs> no. But you're not good programmers yet. From the perspective of NIST or NSA, you're using C++, right? That's their perspective. From the, like, put yourself in the mindset of the early seatbelt, like you got to use it. They're saying like, look, you're not good programmers. You're using C and C++, that's a problem. That's their perspective. You can disagree, right? But a good portion of the pushback against the, this like no more C++ thing, right? When people say like no more C++, you go on Reddit or whatever, Twitter, and people say like, you should just use something else in C++. The meme that comes back at them is, well, I am a good programmer and I don't make mistakes. Therefore, I can just use whatever I want, right? That's, that's like, if, if, if you go down the rabbit hole of the, the memes on the internet, that's the level of discussion we're having. Not very productive, right? But you see that people think very different things. They have very different opinions about this and they, they, they come at it with their own opinions, right? So um, <clears throat> show of hands. So who's caused the car crash here? Yeah, a few people, yeah. Yeah, by driving cars, yeah, a few people, <laughs> right? Right, so, but there's only like 10 people in this audience. I guess there's like 100 people in the audience or something. Uh, so all of you are wearing seat belts, but none of you have ever needed them, right? Just 10 of you. It, it's, it's not a fair comparison, I agree. It's, 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 it's a mental fallacy, in fact. Um, but... Yeah, that, that's okay, that's okay. But my, my point is, contrast this to programming. Like, if you're a great programmer and you don't need any safety or security, you should just not use it, right? Like, that's the level of, of dissonance that people who think you shouldn't be programming in C++ are throwing back at you. They're reflecting that back at you and thinking, well, like, you would wear a seatbelt even if you've never needed it. It is kind of a mental fallacy, but that's the level of discussion that we're having right now, right? <clears throat> and so another show of hands, um, who's responded to a zero-day exploit? And maybe I should define what a zero-day exploit is. Zero-day exploit is when there's software that's out there, someone is, is attacking, exploiting it, right? Using an a, a, a inherent property of your code to do something very, very unintended to it and uh, making it do something that's not meant to do, right? So who's, who's responded to a zero-day exploit? I see, I see quite a few hands, maybe six or something like that, seven? Yeah. Okay, so, so compare that to like having caused a car crash. Like basically someone caused an issue with an unsafe language and only a few people have actually responded to this, right? Have had to go and see, well, okay, there's this thing that's happening, we detected it somehow and we had to respond to it, right? So like the practicalities of having to deal with the effect of unsafety, there's like seven people out of a hundred here have had to deal with it. And um, I want to point out again, C++ now tends to attract a lot of experts, this conference, right? So, so it means that we're probably way over representing the majority of programmers in the world. I would, I would wager that less than 1% of programmers in the world have had to deal with a zero day exploit. <clears throat> Another show of hands. Okay, so who has written code that was found to be responsible for a zero day exploit? Right, so have not just responded to it, but you wrote code and you had to then go and fix it because it was being exploited actively. No one. Right, so again, unsafety has impact and very few of us have dealt with the impact of unsafety in software. And, and let's take kind of a flip side here. Uh, who's written an exploit? I don't necessarily mean used it, right? But like, just you try to understand how do I actually break this thing? It's just some software, right? Any software, who's written an exploit? There's like, there's a good number, maybe like 12, 15, something like that. Right, so that's the flip side, right? Not just trying to fix the problem, but trying to understand how, how, do, I, how do I break this, right? A again, like, I, what I'm trying to show is, do we actually understand what it means to write secure code? 
just from this survey of overqualified people, I think we don't have particularly good qualification in understanding security. Right? If you've never actually tried to deal with a security problem, you're just trying to not have security problems, that's good. Right? You're more advanced than someone who just writes code and never tries to not have a security problem. But you've never actually had to d deal with it or in even tinkered with what would it be like to break this thing. Right? So do you feel qualified to understand what security is when you've never actually tried to do it? Right, I'm going to go back to a car. Who's ever like, changed the oil on a car? Right, like bare minimum of like car competency is you open the hood of a non-electric car and, and you try to do an oil change. Right? Like, would any of you say, you know, yeah, I drive a car, so I'm really competent at cars, if you've never opened the hood and tried to understand what's in it? But you write programming all day, it's like driving a car, and I think you're not particularly qualified at security. That's okay, right? It's just a fact. Now, ask how many people try to spin a car. To spin a car, too, yeah. That's a difficult uh, skill as well. But, like, compare our qualifications, overqualified C++ now people, to the people criticizing us. Now, I, I don't think everyone in the NSA is qualified to like do hacking, but I, I think the NSA has a good number of people who's, who have hacked stuff before. I'm going to guess, right? And they're criticizing us, and I think they know what they're talking about. And I think it's the same thing about the other headlines. Maybe not Vice, maybe not the Register. Although with a name like the Register, you kind of have to like you know, register. It's a C++ thing. Right, but um, I, I think some of them are actually quite qualified to do that criticism. Maybe it's unfair criticism, but they're still fairly qualified, right? And so, you know, they're, they're, how how do you get qualified to develop secure code? How do you get qualified to create mitigations and to understand what an adversary might do to your code? Well, I think it's in trying it out, or at least reading about it. Um, and we we. We may feel in this room that we're qualified to develop secure code, create mitigations, to, to understand what an adversary might do. But you know, again, we're a conference that overrepresents highly qualified C++ folks. Um, <clears throat> so you know, our, our collective qualifications just aren't representative of the wider C++ community. <clears throat> All right. And then, how do we increase our qualifications? Right. I think. You probably agree that we're not particularly well qualified in this. Well, if we don't think we're sufficiently qualified, then one easy path is to attract more people who are qualified in safety and security to participate in C the future of C++, to participate in the standards committee, to participate in uh, implementation and things like that. If the committee is not qualified, then let's bring in qualified folks. Uh, so for example, I don't believe that the NSA and NIST are participating in C++. Right? They're sure pointing fingers, but they're not participating. They're externally participating. I would like it if folks like this were participating in groups. So we have a group in the C++ committee called SG23, the safety and security uh, subgroup. They could join it. Reach out to me. My email address was at the beginning of the thing. At the end, I'll help you join. Uh, a good number of industry experts have joined already. Right? I've, I've reached out to people I know. I know people in other companies have done that and have them reach this, this, this subgroup that's trying to improve the safety and security of C++. It's a fairly new group. I think it was opened in the last year, so it's not like shown many results yet. Uh, ISO, uh, so, so C++ is in WG21, Working Group 21, very confusing naming. Uh, we also have a separate working group called WG23 about vulnerabilities. It's funny that it aligns with SG23, but there's a separate group about vulnerabilities. Confusing naming, but ISO also has a thing trying to at least qual quantify what those safety and security issues look like. Um, and another approach to get more qualified is for the people we have in the committee already or in the community to get qualified, get some more skills. Right, so if you have buddies in the NSA or whatever, ask them to join. Uh, but it, if you yourself want to get better, you, you can. There's ways to learn about this. Um, I won't teach you that right uh, in this talk. don't have enough time. But this is a paper, and there's an associated YouTube talk that's a really great way to start understanding at least what, what does it mean to take uh, emergent behavior out of software and make it do something that the software creator didn't expect it to do. Creating a weird machine out of it. Right? I think it's a really good way to explain that. There's a YouTube video as well. But it, it explains to you how an adversary constructs an exploit from that behavior. Right? Another place to start is, is my colleague Robert Secord here has written a book on secure coding in C and C++. Uh, he wants much more sales. So Robert, you, you want to sell more books? Yeah. 
Yeah, he'll sign him. He'll sign him for you. Um, crypt cryptographic signature or just like... Yeah, so Robert has written a book about this as well. There's other resources, right? But that, these are like nice starting points. And I want to give you a bit more uh, motivation. Like, what I've described so far are kind of ad hoc solutions, right? Bringing more people in doesn't actually fix the problem. It's ad hoc. It's more tactical than strategic. We've, so far, we've found problems, and we fix them by either bringing in experts or building up the expertise or whatever. It's a bit reactive, uh, reacting to what seems like a, a public relations deluge onto C and C++ right now. It's not actually motivated on its own, right? We're reacting to the headlines by saying, so we need to do something. Right? So I'd like to give you separate motivation to actually want to do the safety and security thing on your own. Ignore the headlines. You would want to do this. And the way I'm going to do that, and you might not all be attracted to this, but I'm going to talk about ethics. Um, so I think software has become central to society, and that's why you're seeing a lot of reaction to what uh, C and C++ are doing as, as it, its impact on society. So why do I want to talk about ethics? I, I, I just don't think that most computing professionals realize that software is much more central to society today than what it used to be. And we don't generally see ourselves as having a responsibility towards society. Like when you program, you get up in the morning, have your coffee, you start programming. You don't think like, responsibility to society today. I'm going to do that. Right? And I'd like to convince you that you actually do, or most of you do. Right? Now, to anchor this ethics discussion, I chose the uh, ACM, Association for Computing Machinery. Uh, they have a code of ethics, because I think it's excellent, uh, not just in the section about safety and security, but overall. Uh, it's fairly long, uh, but it's very relevant to computing. It's the Association for Computing Machinery. Right? So I'm going to look at the code of ethics. And I, I, I apologize. Usually, I don't do talks with a lot of text. This is the only section with a lot of text. I am going to make a sin and read the text off the screen for you. But I've highlighted in black the sections that matter, and I won't read the grayed out sections. The code of, conduct is, uh, the code of ethics is much longer. I really recommend you read it. I, I actually was really excited when I read it the first time. I'm sorry I have boring hobbies, but reading a code of ethics was really cool. I really loved it. Um, and I'll focus on two sections out of that entire code of ethics. Uh, uh, the first one I'll focus on is avoiding harm, section number two. Okay, so avoiding harm. And I'm sorry for sinning. I'm going to read off the slides. So harm means negative consequences, especially when those consequences are significant and unjust. Let's go to the next one. Well-intended actions, including those that accomplish assigned duties, may lead to harm. When that harm is unintended, those responsible are obliged to undo or mitigate the harm as much as possible. Avoiding harm begins with careful consideration of potential impacts on all those affected by, de by decisions. In either case, ensure that all harm is minimized. To minimize the possibility of indirectly or unintentionally harming others, computing professionals should follow generally accepted best practices unless there is a compelling ethical reason to do otherwise. Those involved with pervasive or infrastructure systems should also consider principle 3.7, which I'll talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> A computing professional has an additional obligation to report any signs of systems risk that might result in harm. If leakers do not act to curtail or mitigate such risks, it may be necessary to blow the whistles to reduce potential harm. All right, and section 3.7, uh, I hope you see me coming, recognize and take special care of systems that become integrated into the infrastructure of society. So let's read that section. So even the simplest computer systems have the potential to impact all aspects of society when integrated with everyday activities, such as commerce, travel, government, healthcare, and education. When organizations and groups develop systems that become an important part of the infrastructure of society, their leaders have an added responsibility to be good stewards of these systems. Part of that stewardship requires establishing policies for fair system access, including for those who may have been excluded. That stewardship also requires that computing professionals monitor the level of integration of their systems into the infrastructure of society. As the level of adoption changes, the ethical responsibilities of the organization or group are likely to change as well. Continual monitoring of how society is using a system will allow the organization or group to remain consistent with their ethical obligations outside of the code. And when appropriate standards of care do not exist, computing professionals have a duty to ensure that they are developed. So why am I talking about ethics? Well, the, you might not think right now that you're in a position of ethics, but NSA, NIS, Consumer Reports, and others think that you are. And they see the committee and implementers as being in dereliction of duty. Doesn't matter if you think it's true or not, that's the perception. 
and they think we failed our ethical responsibilities. If, look, if you look back at the definition from the ACM, C++ is kind of pervasive in the world, right? And it has impact on the world in terms of safety and security. And I want to be fair to us computing professionals. Computers were not integral to everyday aspects of society even like 20 years ago, right? Many of us started our career when computing had significantly less impact on society. It was a fun thing, right? Nowadays, there's like fridges and light bulbs and microwaves and whatever else that have computers in them, right? That's a big change in the last few years, right? And that type of change, it sneaks up on you, I would say, right? Like it's not something that you're thinking about every day. Does my fridge have a computer? Does my fridge have a computer? Is it in C++, right? Um, <clears throat> it's changed, right? And I see myself as the chair of the C++ language evolution as having an ethical responsibility towards making C++ safer and more secure, right? And I hope that many of you find that you also have such an ethical responsibility. Maybe not now, but you know, we can talk about it a bit more. So trying to convince you that this is kind of important to do, right? Uh, how do we actually put it in practice? Well, <clears throat> This is a bit tricky because, again, we don't all agree on what safety and security mean and how to approach it. Uh, so I, I want to do a little show of hands here. Uh, who was born before the first programming language with an optimizing compiler was implemented? I, I, I'm playing around with this artistic liberty here because there's the analytical engine in 1883 and then autocode in 1952. Nitpickers, you don't need to stand up. So after this, right, so the first real like, big programming language that was created, who was born after that? Do you even know what, what language that is and when that was? If you were at the panel two days ago, you know, because I said it. Fortran, yeah, Fortran 57, right, developed by John Backus' team at IBM, right? So who was born between 57? A few of you were, right? So I'm going to say, like, the whole field of programming languages is pretty new, right? And a lot of us have seen a lot of evolution in that field over time. Right, so when I say it sneaks up on you, like that's the type of thing that like, you know, if you were born before compilers or programming languages, that's like a, you, you see that there's been a lot of change even in your lifetime. So compare that to other things that can break in society. I'm not going to humor you by asking if you were born before the first airplane was created or before the first car or the first building. Airplanes can fail, cars can fail, buildings can fail. Right? But you in your lifetime have not seen these like giant leap advances in these fields as much as you've seen as we've seen in computing. They have had pretty big advances, but not as big as computing. <clears throat> All right, so show of hands. Um, in that vein, who's gotten angry at software in the last week? Right? Yeah, pretty much everyone except the people who are sleeping. And I, I want to con contrast this. So another show of hands here. Um, Who's gotten angry at a building just ever? <laughs> a, a few people, I think you're kind of being funny here. I sent this to someone else and they said, I got angry at Apple Park every day. I actually like Apple Park, but whatever. Um, but like compare this, the, the, the buildings to like software, we've not just computing professionals, I think all of society have agreed that software is just kind of bad. You just turn it off and on again and stuff like that, right? It's, it, we've accepted that software just doesn't really work very well. Right? It's kind of weird. You can get angry at a building from being misdesigned, but buildings just kind of work, right? Most of them just kind of work, right? <laughs> and, and in fact, in fact, Margaret Hamilton, pictured here uh, with the Apollo guidance computer uh, source code, um, she, she coined the term software engineer or, or popularized it. Uh, IEEE had an addition uh, 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 in 2018 celebrating 50 years of software engineering. And when you compare to other engineering fields like mechanical engineering or civil engineering, uh, how often do you think about safety like when you're in a building? Right? Like you're in this building right now. Uh, I don't really think about safety. I live in the middle of earthquake prone Tokyo biggest metropolitan area in the world. Uh, I work on the 18th floor of a building. Uh, the only time I think about building safety and earthquakes and stuff like that is, well, when there's an evacuation drill or uh, when I contrast it to software safety, right? Because like the building just works. I don't have to think about its safety, right? So I think we've accepted that software is error prone. And we've also accepted that most other things that we rely on in society just kind of mostly work. Right, they rarely fail, and when they fail, we're just like, ah, oh, that failed. It was kind of a random luck, 
you know? <clears throat> okay. So uh, um, safety critical practices. So I want to parallel a bit this whole ethical question with how companies that make safety critical systems approach safety. Uh, so it's not that safety critical industries don't make mistakes, they do. Right, uh, But what I appreciate is that when companies like that, the serious one, uh, uh, do, they make promises. They say stuff, and this is a literal quote from someone, uh, don't run away, do not lie, and don't destroy the truth. This is the CEO going to Congress promising this when their thing failed, right? when that goes wrong. And so I'm employed by Toyota, and as an employee, I have to take frequent classes regarding what vehicle safety means, not just software, but the whole vehicle, how you approach making that safe. There's a variety of trainings. Uh, it's developed around real world issues, real world failures uh, that vehicles experience over time. And the training is not meant to be pleasant. It's meant to remind all the engineers of the responsibilities that we have towards the public um, and how to honor those responsibilities as well. And the training goes into root cost analysis and remediation of specific problems and so on. And these are echoed throughout the year. There's a variety of standards that, that, that we follow when we develop things like ISO 26262 and so on. Right? So like in a safety critical industry, not just for software, but for other parts, people have learned how to create layerings to prevent failure from happening, to prevent one single individual from being responsible for a failure. Most zero-day exploits, there's just like one single person who can make that happen. You do a code review maybe, but that's about it, right? So <clears throat> I want to kind of go back on ethics a bit. Uh, who, who's taken an ethics class or studied ethics independently? I'm sorry, that, that, uh, let's go back. I clicked too fast, damn it. Let's not do the show of hands. In that context, who's learned about things like Challenger disaster, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, collapse of que Quebec Bridge, Tacoma Narrow Bridge collapse, Hyatt Regency walkway collapse, St. Francis Dam failure, the Hon Dam disaster. Like when you take these classes, you learn about these. These are all phys physical systems that failed. And if you look at how the reaction of that engineering field, um, how they reacted to those failures, uh, I think it's, it's fairly serious reactions with real inquiries that cause real changes. Well, maybe not all of them, but most of them. Right? And, and imagine like, if you wrote a software bug and you had the equivalent of like, the Challenger disaster inquiry on you, uh, like, imagine what that would mean to you. Right? We're not at the point where software gets that type of, of, of uh, criticism, but imagine like, Feynman being like, on the news channels like, saying you did wrong. Like, it'd be weird because he's dead, but the equivalent of Feynman, you know, uh, like how many of those known problems are, are software type problems that and how what have we learned about them? What do we do when we have software style problems? Well, here's a few examples of good software problems in the last you know, 50 years of computing. Um, <clears throat> one example, uh, Ariane 5, right? Uh, we still have problems of the type that Ariane 5 had, right? It's just one trunc truncation that converted one value to the other caused the rocket to crash. Therac 25, that was 40 years ago, 40 years ago. What caused it? A data race. I'm sure glad data races are fixed now. We don't have any anymore, right? That's not a thing anymore. Uh, so another one, My Mars Climate Orbiter, right? The problem with that was a unit mismatch, right? Like uh, I think it was Lockheed Martin was using a particular set of units, NASA another one. Do we have ubiqu ubiquitous handling of units in C++ and in most programming languages? I know we do in Boost. Don't tell me we do it in Boost. But like, we don't. How much software do you write that handles units in a way that prevents those problems, just makes it impossible? We, we just don't do that very much, right? Uh, Heartbleed, that was a big problem. What it did is it leaked information, including keys, uh, uh, if to anyone on the internet who knew how to exploit it. Uh, because of a missing bounce check, right? Bounce check are still a problem, despite hardly being a big public thing, right? Go to fail, that was a fun one, right? It was just an if statement with a go to and another go to without braces on the if statement. And so there was a, a series of if statements with if go to, if go to, if go to, and there was a go to in the middle that prevented all of the other checks from being run. Because the indentation looked like it was going to be run, it wasn't run. This is just like basic code not being indented, so it, it looked unobvious, right? We still have this type of problem. And Y2K, right? Like, I, I, we were talking about Y2K earlier this week with some people, and um, some people had spent three years of their lives on Y2K. What did we do with it? We just kind of kicked the can down the road after that, right? 2038, we're going to have epochopolyps or whatever it's called, right? Where the 32-bit the uh, time T, 
if we're still using that, is going to wrap around. Don't really know what that's going to mean, but that's still in a lot of places. And why haven't we fixed it? Well, it would be an ABI break to fix it. So when you migrate to a 64-bit platform, if, if you're smart, you think about it, you change it. Otherwise, never going to change it. Right? That, like, that's our reaction. Like, Y2K was extremely, extremely published everywhere in the news. And yet we like, just punted it to 2038, effectively. Um, <clears throat> So I, I want to do a parallel to something that, that exists in a more kind of uh, physical engineering setting. Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer by training. And when I worked at, as an engineer uh, in training on airplanes, uh, there's no way that I could have been the single responsible person for a failure. And there's this concept called uh, Pokayoke uh, that's part of the Toyota production system, but it's used widely. Uh, fun fact, the Toyota production system is how Agile got developed and a variety of other things. It's used in a lot of places. And Pokayoke, the idea is you put a mechanism in place to avoid unexpected surprises. So it's often called just foolproofing, right? So if you forgot to tie your seatbelt in your car, the car beeps at you. Some cars might not just want to drive if you do that. And so, Modern programming languages have some amount of Pokayoke, but not enough, right? So consider the examples I just gave you of software. Uh, I don't expect pervasive solution to all the examples I gave you, right? It's normal to fail. It, it'll happen. It, it doesn't matter how much foolproofing we do. Fools are extremely ingenious, right? We're all going to fail at some point. But right now we have like zero foolproofing. And so if you look at just undefined behavior in C++, represented by this little Cthulhu here, uh, it's, it's in this beautiful snow globe, right? Would you program with Cthulhu right next to you, tentacles flipping, and any little like mistake you make, the glass breaks and Cthulhu just eats your entire house? Like, no, but that's what we're doing when we program. One tiny mistake and all bets are off. That's what we're actually unleashing on users. There's places where we do better than that, but that's really what we're doing when we standardize things or when we create libraries or whatever else. That, that's just what it feels like. Right? It's like, you made a mistake, all bets are off, undefined behavior on you. Right? We call this nasal demons or whatever else. Like, that's what we're doing. We're programming with Cthulhu just waiting to, to like jump on us. It's not great. Right? Whereas in other engineering practices, there's layerings that prevent you from having these mistakes jump on you. You can still make mistakes. It's much harder. All right, so show of hands. <clears throat> Who thinks that we can collectively do more to meet our ethical obligations? Yeah, most people, except someone sleeping there. OK, so we being just the programming community, not, the, the, not necessarily the committee, not necessarily like uh, individual people, but like we collectively. Right? I think individuals have to do things, but just us together. So, and compare yourselves to like other engineering fields. Right? It's, again, it's not that they don't make mistakes. There's still failure in a variety of things that have been well honed over hundreds of years in engineering uh, uh, terms. But they hold themselves accountable when they make mistakes. They apply foolproofing. They analyze potential failure modes before deploying stuff. And they work to prevent mistakes when possible. I don't think we do this very well in programming. And again, like I want to really emphasize, none of us meant for this. We don't wake up thinking, I'm going to do evil today. I assume who like, don't raise hands if you want to do evil in the morning. <laughs> <clears throat> but like, I assume most of you don't intend to do that, right? It's just like, we don't want to cause harm, but it happens inadvertently in some cases. And the committee and implementers, I know they're really passionate people, right? They want to improve their corner of the world. So they focus really deep on particular things. They want to help others. They like to geek out. They like to optimize code. They talk about Sfine and CRTP and name lookup particularities and ADL and stuff, and the various ODRs, right? We love all the different types of ODRs, and we should talk about this later at the bar. There's so many ODRs, they're great. But what's the impact been of just focusing on these cool things and not seeing kind of the like, oh, hey, safety and security kind of a thing, right? We kind of just, yeah, someone else's, it's someone else's problem. Someone else is going to deal with it. <clears throat> and so, you know, I talked mostly about security just now, right? Like most of the things that are in public are security, but I want to tie it to safety. And, and, and I think the criticism comes from security, but really what we're talking about is safety, right? And I think we should spend most of our effort on security, but it really means spending effort on safety. And so what's weird though is, is safety is kind of like a, a Rorschach test. Like you, you, everyone looks at it and says, this is a fox. No, it's a bunny. No, it's something else. Like when we talk about type safety, memory safety, threat safety, functional safety, none of us mean the same thing. 
we mean roughly the same thing, but we don't actually mean the same thing. So I, I'll try to have a high level, like here's what I think this means. Uh, we had a panel about this on Monday, right? And we had some disagreements on it, it's cool. Uh, but let's discuss what that means. And there's a lot of references on the internet for different types of definitions. And so when, they, when people talk about type safety, uh, it usually means you know, prevent type errors. And type errors are attempts to perform operations on values that are not of the appropriate data type, right? Now, it's a loose definition. It, type safety prevents type errors, cool. Right? And this can be at compile time, um, sometimes making the language undecidable if you try to enforce really complex types. Right? So some languages allow you to have really, really complex type relationships, express what type safety you want to have, and then checking the correctness of that type uh, makes the language undecidable, and then the language makes trade-offs in how it decides to, to, to enforce the type error. Either it tells you, like, I can't do this, or it you know, allows you to try a lot. And some of them do this at runtime. Right? Some of them have type safety enforcement at runtime. It's not a satisfying definition, but what you'll find, in, in my experience, that literature has a variety of definitions which also hinge on language-specific boundaries of what is appropriate. Right? So, so, like, what's a data type is highly dependent on the programming language, and what's appropriate is highly dependent on what the programming language defines it to be. And I'll give you an example. Right? You'll, you'll find this very unsatisfying. Well-typed programs cannot go wrong. Now, you're saying, this guy, what does he know? Like, kind of a clown saying this. Uh, no, nah. <laughs> <Nah. laughs> this guy has a Turing Award, uh, and if you know about like types, Hindley Milner type systems, like Milner, it's the same name, it's him. Uh, so he's got a Turing Award, and he's saying like, well, type programs can't go wrong. That's his definition. Um, so it's not that like you know just anything goes. You know, but let's look at another definition. Uh, a language is type safe if the only operation that can be performed on data in the language are those sanctioned by the type of the data. That's kind of similar to the other definition, right? Like types say you can do this, and if that's the only thing that you do, then you're type safe. Now, I like this one because it's about Java not being type safe, right? Let's bash on Java instead of C++. It's always fun, right? But um, I, I, I think the only way you can find satisfaction in, in what type safety actually mean is that you have to look towards fairly complicated to understand topics such as uh, operational semantics and denotational semantics to obtain a satisfying definition. And you might not find it satisfying because it's kind of mathy and it kind of like hurts your brain, right? So, so it's not very intuitive, but it's very f formal as a definition. But I think like having these informal definitions is still useful to help us advance what we think about type safety. And <clears throat> when we talk about type safety, pretty often in C++, yeah, we, we can totally make type safe C++, right? There's claims that this can be made. Uh, if you look at the C++ core guidelines and other static analyses, uh, there's tools like RAII, pointer safety, spans, ranges, null pointer initialization, invalidation, casting, variance. If you just use these things and nothing else, yeah, it can probably be type safe, right? But Sure, even if we assume that with these tools it's possible to get type safety, at the moment it's just not happening. Right? Like who follows all the things I mentioned and has type safe C? I don't think anyone does. So the frequent argument is that doing all these things is kind of the same thing as rewriting your code from scratch. And at this point, if you already have code and you're gonna rewrite it, the argument that often comes up is just use another language. Because there's nothing that prevents you from going outside of what type safety should be. It's very hard, right? Once you make one misstep, like undefined behavior bites you. Whereas in other languages, maybe it's easier. So my view is the standard that libraries and tools just aren't really serving their users particularly well because they have all of this, you know, quote unquote legacy uh, uh, that, that's there, right? So they could be serving us better. <clears throat> so that was type safety. Memory safety. So I refer to this paper, which has a really good definition. It's funny because Sean, uh, Sean gave a talk earlier this week where he mentioned the same paper. Uh, and so I, I think it's a validation that we have that. Uh, so memory safety is often discussed as one of the things that are missing from C++. So for example, the article from the register that I quoted earlier, uh, memory safety is the new black. I, I wear black, I like black, it's cool. Uh, so, so there's the outer code. And there's also academic definitions, right? So I think uh, this is useful to agree to a common definition. Uh, so this one I think is pretty good. It defines what memory safe programs lack usually when you look at definitions, whereas this one doesn't define memory safety as when you don't have X. It instead says this is what you need to have memory safety. Right? So def definitions by omission tend to be fairly unsatisfying. And so I think this one does a really good job of defining what it actually means to have it. 
Now, I'll do a loose definition of, of, of memory safety. For me, it's more or less like you don't have US, use after freeze, you don't have out of bounds accesses, and then you kind of have type safety. I'm going to hand wave here. I think Sean gave a really good definition of his talk. There's a link here. Uh, and I think um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the talk by Chandler, the first one, carbon successor strategy, had a good definition of type safety or a good uh, memory safety, a good uh, uh, discussion of that. So I'll refer you to that. Uh, but I think that's a good starting point. And then, you know, when we talk about this again, we say like, you know, what is memory safe C++, right? Now, you could maybe achieve this through types. For example, you have containers that don't allow dangling references. You have smart pointers, which manage memory lifetime, such as like uh, unique ownership or reference counting. Uh, but, you know, like Rust also has the borrow checker that makes it easy. So like when, where there's ownership and borrowing and lifetime rules in the program, they prevent the programmer from getting to a point where the program is memory unsafe. Swift has the same thing. Uh, so there's other approaches that would require fewer changes to the language, right? So, so like, can type safety be achieved in C or C++? I, I think so. Uh, so there's a few examples I give you here. Uh, so there's a talk at the LVM developer meeting in Europe this morning about uh, F-bound safety. Uh, so Apple talked about it in their memory safety guide. There's someone who reverse engineer what Firebloom is. And there was a talk this morning from EuroLVM that talked about it. This more or less does type safety for uh, type safety and memory safety for uh, C code, I believe. So there's something that's possible. I believe it's uh, expandable to C++. <clears throat> this is just for iBoot, though, so the very early boot of your thing. I think it can be expanded to more than that. Another example is Secure. It's a publication about this. There's Cyclone, great publication about that as well. And uh, Chromium, the, the base engine for Chrome and uh, Edge browsers, have OilPen and Miracle Pointer, really interesting stuff. And they have a bunch of blog articles that explain how they approach the safety in C++. In C++. It's not always practical for everything, but I think they have a lot of interesting stuff. There's other examples of research or, or whatever about uh, memory safety. But the thing is, you're always doing trade-offs when you do these things. Right? So something like iBoot doesn't particularly care about performance. It cares a lot more about memory usage. So it can do trade-offs there. Secure and Cyclone made huge trade-offs when they do stuff. And, and OilPen and Miracle Pointer, well, you have to adopt them. And then like, you have a GC inside of C++ and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do. But there's always trade-offs when you try to do these things. And what's tricky in our position, just the C++ committee or something like that, is that we can't impose those problems, th those trade-offs upon others. And I think that's something that's worth talking about as well. What do we impose on people when we say, here's how we're going to do it? Right? Do you need to just change your code, or do you need to take, take a hit on performance, or something else like that? OK, another types of safety, thread safety. So I'll loosely define it as no data races. Uh, and we'll look at the standard here, intro.races, say the execution of a program contains a data race if it contains two potentially concurrent conflicting actions, at least one of which is not atomic, and neither happens before the other. So I'll, I'll define thread safety to not having data races. This is a bit of a mouthful. So I, I look back at a definition that Hans Bohm gave in a paper called N2480 that I think is more palatable. It just says a data race occurs when two ordinary accesses to a scalar, at least one of which, which is a write, are performed simultaneously by different threads. I think that's easier to grok. Right? That's kind of what a data race is. Um, <clears throat> and the way C++ is set up, you have sequential, se uh, sequential consistency for a data race free program. Right, so we're good. We don't have data races in C++, right? No. Well, so remember what I said about undefined behavior, right? Uh, all it takes is one mistake, one tiny data race, and then your entire program is like just void, right? It's a bit hyperbole, but that's actually what it ends up uh, showing up as, right? Like thread safety seems silly. It seems unlikely to happen, but there's a good number of exploits that come out of thread unsafety, right? And a, 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 a determined um, a determined person who tries to exploit a program can just try and try again fairly often and eventually get lucky with the data race and get an exploit going. Right? So that actually happens quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> so what can we do about this? Well, for, for thread safety, there's a few things I think we can do. Uh, we can enforce mutual exclusion through types, uh, so single ownership or, or guarded exclusion. Uh, we could do something like harder data structures and algorithms to make it easier to avoid having thread safety. You could do static analysis that find races. There's quite a, good, a few good ones. They tend to not be global analyses. Right? I think global analyses are better. Uh, those are kind of rare, but I think e even the local ones do pretty well. And then you can do dynamic analysis to prevent races, right? to see when they happen in the wild. Or you could do testing with thread sanitizer. Now, again, testing is 
If you test with thread sanitizer, that's great, but it only finds data races that occur in your test. It doesn't find the ones that might occur in the wild, right? So you have to have really good tests to find those problems. Um, <clears throat> So we have all these things and there are still exploits caused by lack of thread safety. So arguably it's not really working fully that we have these things in C and C++. Some of them because you have to adopt them and people use different tools. And what's, again, I'm gonna say Rust because like you can't not say Rust, but I like how Rust uses the borrow checker to meet this goal in a consistent manner. And it calls this fearless concurrency. Like you, we talked about PR problems for C++. Fearless concurrency sounds awesome. Like if I could have that for C++, it'd be great. But the problem is we have all these things that you can do in C++, we can't remove any of them. And so you can't be fearless unless you use just the right things. And most of the time we just don't agree on what the right things are because we have different applications domains where th those are different. <clears throat> all right, so this is all this, the, the kind of computer science safeties that I wanted to talk about. The last one I want to talk about is uh, functional safety. And that's a bit different. I think a few people in the audience might not be familiar with it, so I'll spend a bit of time on it. So let's talk about functional safety. So it's, it's different because it's not pure computer science. And for this section, I, I want to refer to this book by Chris Hobbs, who's extremely good. He's a great teacher, his books are really good. Uh, and and uh, I also want to recommend my coworker, Andreas Weiss. He has a talk tomorrow on functional safety where he covers more than what I have time to cover. But he talks about this quite a bit. <clears throat> uh, so I'll look at this book a bit uh, as a reference to define functional safety. He defines a safety critical system as a system whose failure can lead to injury, loss of human life, or extensive property or, environ or environmental damage. And if you think back to the ethics definition that we have, like that's that fits squarely in there. Right? It says like you have an ethical responsibility to do things. And in fact, there's regulations that regulate safety critical systems. <clears throat> and then he defines functional safety as the systematic process used to ensure that failure doesn't occur. Now, this doesn't talk about programming. It doesn't talk about C++. It talks about the process that you use to get there. And processes encompass more than just the language you use. It encompasses how you get to code being written and it covers people. Right? Like the people writing the code have to know uh, what the, the process is to get there. It covers their own uh, um, training and their own actions. <clears throat> All right. And then uh, we talk about bugs fairly often in programming. I think that's a really loose definition. Uh, in functional safety, there's this really nice segregation of definition. We define faults as passive flaws, something that's in your thing that's not necessarily manifesting, it's just there. It's a problem, but it's a fault. Then there's errors, which is when a fault causes the program to perform in a way that causes an unintended outcome. And then failure is when a functional unit is no longer able to perform its required function. So a fault can, but that does not need to manifest into an error. An error can, but does not need to manifest into a failure. And I think that's a useful way to separate instead of just saying there's a bug, right? And, um, <clears throat> And what's great about this approach is that it considers the entire system, not just the software parts. And what's difficult is that the solution to reach functional safety in a, a safety critical system is often really onerous. And it's very application specific. The way people do functional safety in aviation and in automotive is very different. Even though nominally it's kind of the same thing, it's extremely different. And that's sometimes because the system creators are on the side of caution. Right? You want to be more cautious to, because you have a responsibility towards the public. And, but it's also because we don't have a better known, well-trodden path. Right? You're being cautious because this is where people know how to go, how, how to get safety. But there might be a shorter path that actually has more safety, but we don't know about it. So it's a fairly cautious uh, industry. And so in this talk, I discuss the technical aspects of the problem because you know, this is a technical conference, but I want to highlight how important the people aspect of safety is to resolving safety and security issues. So I think in this talk, it, it's mostly high level technical, right? But most people, uh, uh, mo more of the people problem is, is where we're at than the technical problems. And so functional safety in particular puts a big emphasis on people. Right? And I think that's something that we need to look at if we actually want to take action on safety and security for C++. And the way functional safety reaches that is it has processes, standards, certifications, it does testing and verification, and it does test, uh, training and creation of a safety culture. That's how you reach functional safety. And what's a safety culture? Well, it, by and large, the safety culture is a culture that allows the boss to hear bad news. It's a decent definition, right? Like, 
when your program is late and you, like we talked about this in the panel, right? You go to your boss and you say like, look, there's a big amount of insecurity. Your boss just said, like, ship it, ship it, ship it. We talked about this in the panel on Monday. That, that's kind of a problem. Whereas in a safety culture, that does, just doesn't happen. <clears throat> All right. Another thing I want to highlight, and I know Sean disagreed with me about this, uh, no functional safety is possible without security. I, you agreed on that maybe, but to, in my mind, you can't get functional safety without security because an insecure system can be made unsafe by an adversary. Right? So the system in normal operation can be totally safe, but then an adversary can come in and make it do something that's unsafe. So I think that's important. I have this like little diagram that shows my view. Functional safety requires security. Security requires type, memory, and thread safety. Now, I'm not an absolutist. I, if you don't have thread safety, but you have the other two, you have a system that's pretty secure. Right? So I'm not saying, uh, this is hard, we're going to do nothing. Right? I think we should still do something. But it, just one problem can still lead to insecurity that can still lead to lack of safety. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so you can break down all these components and constrain how faults could potentially turn into errors but, and how errors would turn into failure. But if you let anything through, then you don't really have security. Okay, so well, I talked about safety and security. Here's how I break down those two. To me, security is that you have a smart adversary who just needs one hole to defeat your system, right? Usually your adversary is like you know, someone programming and trying to break your system. All they need is one hole. Whereas for, for functional safety, it's, I'll describe it as kind of a semi-random probabilities of failure with a distribution, right? Like things tend to fail with a semi-random distribution. It's not a smart adversary that tries to break your system. Um, and I want to do parallel with survivorship bias. So does anyone know this image? Yeah, a few. So it's a picture of a World War II plane, <clears throat> and they were, they were doing an analysis of where does the planes that land, when they come back from, from uh, bombings or whatever, the ones that land, where, where do they have bullet holes on them? And the team that looked at this initially said, well, we're going to go where there's a lot of red and just reinforce it because there's a lot of holes there, right? And, and intuitively, that seems fine. But if you actually think about it, the planes that come back are the ones that you have data for. Right? So if you have no red hole, that's what you need to harden. Right? Like the pilot's seat has zero red holes. <laughs> right? And, and I, the, the reason I put this up, the survivorship bias, is that to me, security is like you have an intelligent uh, adversary who knows at aim. Right? Like uh, 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 when a hacker tries to break a system, they look and they know where the problems might be. And they know they can aim at the pilot. It's done. Whereas in, in functional safety, it's a random number generator, more or less, right? It'll be somewhere, right? So if you want to increase functional safety, you, you, you try to patch the places that are white, but it's the same thing for security, right? So that's interesting. They're very different types of, of safety security, but the solutions look very much the same. And uh, in industries that do functional safety, we do things that are called the Tara and Ahara, right? So it's a, a thread analysis and remediation analysis and a hazard analysis and risk assessment. And so those are fairly well honed uh, um, approaches to how you try to prevent uh, safety and security issue in a safety critical system. It's very onerous, right? I want to be clear about this. Uh, but <clears throat> the idea of safety is you have to conform to a specification so invariance about what your system is intended to do, right? Uh, and specifications like this, like, you know, I have a car and the car shouldn't crash, the car shouldn't do this, the car shouldn't do that, the car should do this, it should do that. There's a lot of requirements, thousands of them. It's kind of the same when you talk about invariance as what type memory and thread safety are. Now, as I showed earlier, we don't have really clear definitions of them, but if we could reach clear definitions of them, like meeting, conforming to those specifications is kind of the same thing. Right? We can specify what they mean and derive properties from these specifications, and some of them are the same between functional safety and security. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's an, in, an interesting kind of overlap in how different industries have approached this, uh, this problem. And a safety goal would be like preventing unintended acceleration or preventing the loss of steering or something like that. Right? Okay, so uh, another thing that I think... Uh, uh, Sean doesn't agree with me that safety is not correctness. So for me, uh, the specification of type memory and thread safety don't ensure that your program is correct, right? It ensures that your program does what it's specified to do. Now, if you define correctness as meeting the specification, then yeah, they're the same. But usually, 
people have an idea of what their system should do that's not what the specification says. Right? So go back to the definition uh, that Milner had about uh, type safety. It's just like, you know, it, can't, it can't go wrong if you have type safety. That meets the specification, but what does it mean to not to, 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 to follow type safety? Right? It does, like, take the example of the Mars orbiter. Uh, you have doubles and doubles. They represent different units. It's perfectly type safe to go from one to the other yet it doesn't actually meet the correctness goals. And in this case, in the case of the Mars orbiter, it did not meet the functional safety requirements. There was a missing requirement on units. Right? So arguably, the Mars orbiter was, it met the safety goals, but it wasn't correct because it crashed on landing. Right? So I want to make a distinction between safety and correctness. I think that's very important because safety's goal is to remove the unbounded behavior to provide a way to reason about the system when all potential outputs are known. And the goal is explicitly not correctness, as most people understand it. And so the only thing we know right now is, is that failing parts of a specification opens a hole, right, like undefined behavior, and in some cases cause unbounded behavior. Right? And some of these behaviors can be security issues and others. We don't layer these types of problems very well. We don't have kind of foolproofing around this, which is why we have a lot of un unbounded behavior in our programs that we could remove. <clears throat> and I think when we look at implementing safety, I think some of the things that we can do to make programs safer pervasively can trade correctness for safety. What do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> When we consider options towards meeting a specification, so for the C++ language, one trade-off is that we could define behavior. We look at undefined behavior, we say we're going to define this behavior, right? And we, it can help safety at the cost of correctness. In the limit, the safest program is the one that does nothing, right? I've traded correctness for safety. If my program never does anything, totally safe. And, and you know, the mo most functionally safe vehicle is the one that does, doesn't move. You, you said the same thing in your thing, talk, Sean, and I, I like that I had the same thing in mind. But like, it's true. If you get in your car and it doesn't move, it's pretty safe. Um, it's not correct, I would assume. Right? If you go to the car dealership, you buy a car and it doesn't move, are you going to be like, well, it's safe, cool, thank you. <laughs> right? So like, now that you, it's not that you always want to make trade-offs, right? but I think one thing that's been difficult when we talk about trade-offs in the committee and how we want to approach particular things is those trade-offs are someone, sometimes not palatable, right? Um, <clears throat> you, you, you perform something that makes a variety of programs safer, but a small subset of them incorrect, right? That's a hard trade-off to do. Uh, and so it would be nice to like terminate programs as soon as any unsafe behavior is performed, but it's not really practical to do that, right? Like if, if C++ all of a sudden took all undefined behavior that it magically could prove, which is hard, and, and just made the program terminate, you wouldn't really like C++ anymore, right? And I have one concrete example. Uh, so I wrote a, a paper a bit ago uh, that has not been adopted yet about zero initialization of objects of automatic storage duration. So objects on the stack, if this paper is adopted, would just be zeroed automatically for you. Uh, I would argue that it would make programs safer. I would argue that it would make many, many programs uh, incorrect. In fact, if you look at the Linux kernel, uh, there's some data structures where um, certain values being zero means that you're root, right? So before, before applying this patch in Linux, uh, it, it, it would be some, whatever happened to be in the register before and the stack before would be the, the, the user ID. And now I would make it root all the time. Arguably, most programs are more safe by zero initialization. They're not necessarily more correct. Right? And that's a difficult trade-off to make. People are going to start relying on things being zero as well. Does that make people uh, stuff better? Not really, because then your code doesn't look like it's initializing the value, and you don't know whether that lack of initialization was uh, intentional or not. Right? So it's hard to reason about the code after this change, because you write int i semicolon, and the next coworker that comes over doesn't, mean, doesn't know if you meant it's zero at the beginning or not. Right? So the, the, the expressiveness is gone. That's one example of where I think we're trading safety for correctness. <clears throat> All right, so how do we reach priorities? Well, we can prioritize with data, right? I think there, that's an approach that we can take to figure out what to do. So what's the prevalence of each type of exploit class? What techniques are available to the language? What's the cost of each technique? How is each technique adopted? And how does each technique affect the exploit class? That's how I approach 
security communications. Again, I think what we've done so far is a very uh, uh, tactical rather than strategic. This is how we would maybe form a strategy of how to approach this. <clears throat> All right, so what can we do? Uh, what do we think the impact will be? How do we implement them, deploy it, and measure if the planned impact had the effect we intended? That's kind of a scientific method, right? Uh, like, so, so we're gonna figure out what, what does the, the, the class look like, and then you know, what do we think doing a particular uh, change, what do we think it'll do on the exploit landscape? Right? Then you implement, de deploy it, and then see if that expectation is there, and then you iterate on that. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll show you an example. I, I didn't put numbers, the, the numbers are in the references, but here's an example from Microsoft 2018 of all the root cause of CVEs that they measured in all of 2018. They, they have a blog post where they show that number. But roughly they, they, they characterized all the different types of um, root causes for exploits, stack corruption, heap corruption, use after free, type confusion, uninitialized stack, heap out of bound reads, and other. It could be logic bugs or whatever else. And I think this is illustrative of one software vendor's snapshot in 2018 of the type of exploits that they saw. And Microsoft is a pretty big target, right? So my estimate is that in 2018, most other high value targets had exactly the same distribution, right? Just from looking at what Chrome had, Android had, and other companies, it looked roughly like this in 2018. This was the landscape. Uh, it's a valuable source of, of information to decide what we're gonna do, what we're gonna address first. Right? Because you look at one thing, you say, well, this is a small slice of the pie, but it's really easy to address, and then that whole slice goes away. Or this is a big slice of the pie. It's kind of hard to address, but if we address it well, the entire slice is gone. Right? If you could deal with all use after free, right, that'd be cool. Right? Miracle Pointer in Chrome kind of does this. Great. Having a GC obviates most use after frees. It's a huge pie, part of the pie. Right? <clears throat> okay, and then when you remove a slice of the pie, maybe the pie just stays the same though, right? Like when, when I said you want to plan and say, I think I'm going to reduce the exploit, the number of exploits by say 10%. You remove that slice of the pie and then you see in a year what actually happened. Do I still see that the same number of attacks? Sometimes the attackers are smart, right? The, 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 your adversaries, they're not just sitting there saying like, oh, my exploit is gone. What they do is they find another way to get in. Right? So what actually happens is sometimes you put a mitigation in and the numbers just don't change because you've made one thing slightly harder, but there's other ways to, 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 to exploit your code. <clears throat> and so that's kind of a bummer, but sometimes also the, the, pie, chart just, the pie just goes bigger over time, right? There's, there's more kind of the, 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 the hacking community figures out how to like exploit code better and then there's just more exploits over time. Or sometimes you remove a slice of the pie and then the pie just gets smaller and smaller. Right? And ideally, it's, it becomes smaller and smaller over time. Now, again, your attackers are smart. They adapt to what happens. So, for example, when uh, address space layout randomization came out in the like, early 2000s, uh, it was a huge change in how adversaries were able to compromise targets, right? because it randomized where the code and uh, the data were at startup time and at runtime during allocations. <clears throat> and it had, it had a significant complexity for the implementation as well. But when this came out initially, it was a huge deal. Now, if you ask any attacker nowadays, does ASLR do anything to you? They're like, it's kind of just annoying because stuff moves, but like, whatever, it doesn't do much. Now, this was done, ASLR, in the early 2000s. It doesn't do much anymore, and it's still there in the code base, causing a lot of complexity. It's a cost that you pay at startup for many, many things, when nowadays it doesn't really do as much as it used to. I think it's still useful, but is it worth paying for that mitigation? I don't know. Right, so they're intelligent, they, attack, they, they, they adapt to change, and some mitigations turn out to just be minor annoyances, whereas others actually close a door that was open before to, to adversaries. So we should approach our problem solving with that kind of moving target in mind, being able to understand that as we try to close these doors, stuff's gonna change, right? And what's critical to address, what's easy to address, what are the trade-offs, like the bang for buck? Something that people ask me when I show them this pie chart is like, well, who decides what the pie names are, right? There's bug categories that exist. There's NIST that has the bug framework project. I don't really care. Like, I think we need to start measuring things and doing stuff, but the precise bug categories, it's useful. It's, it's worth looking at, but I don't want to like trip on the carpet and like, oh, like what are the bugs categories and just spend a bunch of times classifying bug categories rather than getting stuff done, right? So it's useful, but I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. 
And then <clears throat> what people ask me is like, okay, well, adversaries, what are they? It's just like some hacker, right? Like, what, is, what does it mean to be an adversary? Are you a little mouse with a black cape or something? Is that what an adversary is? Well, <clears throat> something that's critical to understand to me is what are the adversaries? Because different types of attacks come from different types of adversaries and the type of mitigations you put towards them is different, right? So defending against different adversaries requires different things. One example is that some adversaries have just boundless resources. They have no limit on how much money and time they can spend. And, and some of them are extremely intelligent. Right? So if you look uh, uh, at the type of adversaries, <clears throat> it could be a nation state, right? Like, like, let's take the NSA randomly, right? Like they have extremely competent people, huge resources, and they can create a huge load of, of exploits on a variety of things, right? Defending against a nation state is much harder than defending against someone in their basement most days. Right? Uh, uh, because they have boundless resources and they'll find that one hole that you left inside of your software. <clears throat> but they're kind of rare and not everyone is a target to nation states, to people who have boundless resources. Right? So that, that, that's something to consider. What are we actually trying to mitigate? Not just the type of attack, but who is the target and who is the, the, uh, the adversary? Now, another one is organized crime. What's interesting is there's, there's a lot of organized crime just hacking into stuff and doing like ransomware, crypto, whatever, uh, they're usually motivated by money when they do this. And the thing to keep in mind is that organized crime is a well-run business. Usually they're pretty smart. And if you set the bar high enough for a successful exploit, it's not worth the money anymore. The economics don't work out, right? So they're not really selective about their target usually, uh, but they're just looking for profit. And so if you're trying to defeat something like organized crime, ransomware, or whatever else, it's very different from a nation state. They have limited resources because they don't make money out of whatever it is that they do if you set the bar too high. Another one that's kind of weird is, is either loved ones and script kitties. So, so loved ones is, is a weird thing to say, but it's fairly frequent for spouses, partners, parents to spy on their kids and try to find just an off-the-shelf thing that allows them to do that. Right? Now, now, if you happen to develop a platform, that's not necessarily something you want to enable, but those folks aren't usually particularly sophisticated. Right? A script kitty just wants to do a thing and show off to their friends or whatever, or have an off-the-shelf thing and say, like, you know, pop a window on your thing that says, like, ha-ha, I hacked you. It doesn't actually hurt much people, but, like, the loved one's things does, right? Like, tracking your spouses and stuff like that without them knowing, it's pretty bad. And it's something that platforms have to defend against, and they have to defend against, like, just the class of attacks that I showed earlier, the class of exploits. And the last one I want to list is kind of white hats. So they're kind of an odd bunch. I think I'll, I'll point out like Google Project Zero is one, right? They're, they're in there. They're very sophisticated. They more or less have unlimited resources, but they're in there for the ethical purpose. They're not there to cause damage directly to you. They're there to say like, look, there's all these classes of, of issues. We're good at finding them. We're going to tell you. We're going to give you 90 days to fix it. And then we're telling the world that we find this problem. So it's like you have to be ready if you're a big target to be able to react against this. Right? Because they're there to like, help heighten your, your perception of, of the risk that your software exposes. Now, ideally, if you're a large enough and mature company, you have your own red team doing this, trying to like, pretend to be external and trying to figure out how to be an adversary to your code base. If you don't and you become a high value target, you might have random white hats trying to do that. <clears throat> All right, so these are the type of adversaries that I think we're defending against. There's classes of exploits and there's classes of adversaries and they like trying to mitigate those is, is different, right? And so when we look at mitigations, uh, they all come with different impact. There's some mitigations that don't require recompilation, some that require recompilation, some require small code changes and some require significant code changes. It's rare that you don't need to recompile, right? This could be like, I have a process, it's not very really safe, I'm just gonna sandbox it, right? Sandbox it or, or have a different memory allocator might offer you mitigations that you didn't have before. Right? And the, 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 the error in those cases usually just manifests as program termination. Uh, but once you go further than having to recompile, uh, you start requiring code changes and not every programmer wants to change their code. Right? If we change C++ to require code change for things to be safe, uh, a lot of people would be angry at us. Right? So what, what can we actually do as trade-offs? Uh, what do we make opt-in? How do we notify them that maybe they should change their code, but not? you don't really have to, but it looks like a bad thing that you have or something like that. So ideally, when you do a change like this that requires a recompile, the problem shows up as a compilation error, not a runtime error. Because runtime errors are really hard to find, right? Like it, it, 
would you be comfortable shipping a, a, a code, a, a something as a new mitigation that caused just programs to crash randomly in production? Not, not really. Most people aren't, right? Um, so there, there's these two websites here that have a list of uh, uh, hardening uh, approaches that you might want to look at. I would recommend looking at them. They're kind of recompile only, uh, but they have performance impact in some cases. I would also look at, you know, type of code changes that you might warrant. Uh, so Robert has a thing on integers coming uh, yesterday or something, and uh, I've talked about integers. So just if you look at integers, for example, changing your code, if I made all integer overflow trap in C++, uh, that would break a lot of programs. So some people do ship with uh, UBSAN in trap mode where even signed and unsigned integer overflow traps, but that's an opt-in, right? I think it would increase safety if everyone does that, but it's really hard to deploy this. Right? So that's one example of code changes that are hard to deploy. Now, if you look at another language, if you look at Rust, for example, uh, Rust's approach to integer overflow is it panics in debug mode and it does wrapping in release mode. Now, in my previous talk, I, I argue that wrapping is just more or less never actually going to fix your bugs, but at least it doesn't cause unbounded undefined behavior. Right? So it, it's a trade-off, but it's nice. Swift, on the other hand, uh, always reports an error on overflow, and you can opt in to different operators. Instead of just plus, you have a different operator to have uh, no overflow behavior and have wrapping behavior instead. We can't really deploy these things to C++ as the default, because int is just everywhere. If we just start making a trap at runtime, it's going to cause a lot of issues with production software. So we're kind of shackled in what we can do. So if we look back at our pie chart, uh, each of these issues, they have a handful of ways that we can mitigate them. And I focused on the language so far, but you can mitigate stuff outside of language, outside of C++, right? So uh, consider uh, a lot of the mitigations I talk about, they have overlap in them. You can compare the impact that each mitigation has with different types of adversary, right? Like whether someone is trying to target a single person, so probabilistic uh, mitigations won't really defeat them uh, versus someone just trying to target the whole world where probabilistic mitigations will defeat them. And think about, you know, where are you shifting costs to? Each of the mitigations that we deploy might shift costs to someone else. And also think about, like, you know, not just uh, um, the logic errors, but also, like, what's this, what does it mean to be safe by default? I haven't talked about that this much, but I think logic errors and, and things like that are really useful. We can think about pattern matching as a way to reduce logic errors. Right? Pattern matching in and of itself is not a safety or security feature, but if you use it pervasively in your code base, I do think it reduces safety and security issues. Uh, so the mitigations I've mentioned so far are about being kind of safe by default, but a good programming language also has correctness by default by being more expressive. <clears throat> and you know, one example I want to give is uh, C++ had a proposal for a while for networking. Uh, I put out a paper a while ago to try to make it secure by default, and I had huge pushback on this. Right? And that's because we all have different priorities. Some people just want to open a socket and talk to something on the internet. And to me, shipping sockets without being able to have safety with them is just a no-go. And we don't have the same priorities. And so we get pushback when we talk about these things. All right, and what can we do outside the language? Well, you know, outside the language, there's stuff like the hardware can change. There's new things like Porter Auth, MTH, Sherry, uh, uh, linear uh, address <clears throat> on, in Intel. That's stuff that you can use to increase security. Should C++ rely on that? Maybe. You can change the operating system. You can, change the, you can put the load of unsafety on the users. That's more or less what we do today on the end users or on the programmer, right? That's more or less what our language does today. Uh, you can put it on frameworks. You can put it on other standards or something like that, right? But the idea is you want to shift the load where it's less uh, expensive to have, right? What the cost is of there. And then you have caveats when you try to uh, deploy things. <clears throat> so the, the SQLite article, now SQLite is written in C, right? But their takeaway from static analysis is it's useless. It, it increases the number of bugs in SQLite rather than decrease it. Now, that's their point of view. It's in C, not C++. But there's always a cost to deploying things. Normally, a, a, um, static analysis is trying to reduce the bug rate, but they found that it increases it. <clears throat> right, so we have to understand different users and how they're affected. And then... You know, again, I really want to emphasize like stuff that changes that impacts compile time is much, much, much better than stuff that would impact runtime because runtime is hard to find. If you don't have sufficient testing, you'll never find it. So for example, uh, when I worked at Apple at some point, I, I broke the XNU kernel by deploying a mitigation that made a benign read from a variable that was uninitialized uh, trap, 
instead. Now, that variable was never used. So technically, it's undefined behavior, but it's completely unexploitable. I made a trap and the kernel would crash. Right? So I had to debug this. Very fun. <clears throat> um, now, when you write new code, the argument is often right in Rust. But the, the quip that I really like is, you know, program is impossible. Rust simply enforces it at compile time. What I want you to get away from this is, like, it's hard when you have a language that imposes more type-related constraints on you to write code if you don't know how to do it. Right, migrating from C++, it's a pretty big step because the mental model is very different. Again, I want you to think about the, the people impact. Even if we did things like this in C++, are we making it harder to program? And are people going to be unhappy because we made C++ harder to use? Right now, it's easy to use, easy to get performance with, hard to write safe, correct, and, uh, and secure code. It's a trade-off that we've made, but if we try to make it harder to do those things, we then make it harder to program sometimes. So it's a trade-off on the user, the programmer. But the other quip I have is that you know, C++ has all the default wrongs. Right? Can we change some of the defaults? Maybe. I think that's what Carbon's trying to do. I think that's what Val is trying to do as well, change the defaults. Having just value semantics is a really interesting thing. It shifts the burden to different places. It's a different mental model in how you approach things. So when you write new code, maybe you can choose another language, but it has an impact on your users as well. And so there's really a, a, a trade-off between more modern languages and older languages. Right? Modern languages, uh, they, they've, they've learned from their predecessors. They impose restrictions on programmers. They have better defaults and better foolproofness. And older languages have more freedom. They have mistakes from their youth that are hard to fix, but they have a lot of experience from their longevity. People know how to program them. There's a lot of tooling around them. And, and I kind of characterize this as like standardized work, right? Like, um, the idea of standardized work is you, you take away freedom from the developers, from the person on the, the assembly line or something like that, to help them focus on what's useful. Right? The fact that C++ has so many ways to do the same thing doesn't necessarily help you. It just confuses you and makes, makes it hard to write correct programs. And so standardized work, by removing freedoms from developers, arguably Rust, for example, makes it harder to do certain things, but it makes it easy to do the right things correctly. And I, I want to do a parallel with what Barack Obama says. Like, he only dresses with two suit colors, or used to, right? And, and the reason for that, the mental burden and not having to do that allows him to do his job better. And I think as programmers, we have a mental burden because there's so many ways to do all the things in C++. Imagine if you had two ways to do all the things, you wouldn't be, like, arguing about it and making mistakes and whatever else, because it's much easier, it composes better, and so on, right? Um, and so I, I, I make this akin to like having this tool belt with all these tools in it. I don't know what these tools are. I don't know. I just use the hammer. Everything's a nail, right? Uh, so a multi-paradigm language is powerful, but at the same time, having fewer paradigms, making it just more constrained, and having the right defaults makes it easy to do certain things and hard to do the wrong things. Now, arguably, sometimes it makes it hard to get performance. Right, so that's something that is good for C++. We're great at performance. So for new code, maybe you should use a new tool. Should you rewrite old, old code or somehow sandbox it to dampen the impact of its failures? That's a question that depends on a lot of factors. Right? And the meme on the internet is just rewrite it in Rust. Right? Uh, but what's interesting is you look at, this is a quote from Android. They started rewriting parts of Android in Rust. And they say, to date, there have been zero memory safety vulnerabilities discovered in Android uh, Rust code. They've written, uh, recently, they've written 21% of their new code in Rust, and they've had zero vulnerabilities in there. Now, maybe that'll change over time, but it's a really interesting data point. And that's not the only place. Uh, so the, the Google quote I have is here, but there's also Microsoft's trying to rewrite a lot of their code in Rust. There's also uh, Rust for Linux that's being used. There's uh, sudo and su that are being rewritten in Rust. There's a bunch of it in Rust and, and Chromium. Uh, and then Amazon and AWS is using a bunch of it. Volvo is starting to use Rust a lot. Toyota is starting to use Rust a lot. Uh, so people are experimenting with it and other languages, but I think Rust is fairly mature. Now, I talked about Rust a lot in this slide. Should we rewrite code in XYZ? Right? Should we use Swift? Uh, should we use Carbon eventually? I think Swift is fairly mature, right? but it's, it has its, its advantages. But uh, John gave a great talk about how to migrate code bases to Swift. Chandler gave a case for, for Carbon, but as he admits, it's not quite ready for prime time. It'll take a while to get there. Should you lose, look at other things like Val uh, um, <clears throat> that do different trade-offs, different ergonomics, different safety properties? Uh, I, I think it's worth looking at those. But I, like, again, I think C++ is here to stay for a long time, and just rewrite it in the latest trendy thing is not necessarily what we want to do. Right, so is this a PR problem? 
right? Yeah, I, I think it is, right? Uh, but many in the C++ community are worried about the PR problem. I don't think the PR problem really matters, right? It's just people are realizing this a problem. Uh, whether you think the criticism is warranted or not just doesn't matter. It's there. There's, a, there's criticism, and I think there's things that need to be addressed, not do a PR counter-strike. Right? We don't just say, like, C++ is secure now. New York Times, please publish this. Op-ed. Like, that won't do anything, right? It'll just get us laughed at. Um, and the problem is it goes beyond PR problems. I think it'll get to regulations, right? So if, if you governments start getting in there, uh, your PR problem will become security mandates. It could be changing the liability landscape from the user to the supplier, right? So the person who wrote the code would not be liable. Uh, it could be adding mandates on professional responsibility, so professional engineers or something like that, as in other fields. It could be mandating standards uh, which subset what parts of a programming language can be used or mandating which programming language can be used, right? That might happen. And governments can enforce regulations, right? They can say, they can mandate that their contractors hold to these restrictions. If the US government decides everyone we deal with has to use this, you know, that, that's gonna change the landscape a lot. They could tie the requirements to different types of government funding or subsidies, right? So not their direct uh, 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 contractors, but they could say, you don't get subsidies if you use C++ or something like that. That's totally possible. And they can enforce the mandates within their jurisdiction. Right? California does this for emissions on cars. California is a good, uh, a, a huge place where, where cars are sold, and they have in the world some of the highest regulations on vehicles. And what happens in California ends up affecting the rest of the world, those regulations. You could do the same thing in programming languages. Um, <clears throat> now, governments aren't silly, right? They know that mandates have a cost, and they know how to offset them. Uh, they could offset them by uh, quantifying the risk of security failures in software for particular fields, right? So quantifying that risk. Uh, they could quantify the cost of a failure and then assess the cost of different countermeasures and finally consider whether the cost outweighs the risk of the failure. So have some analysis to figure out how to move the field over time in the places where it's the most worth it. And then, you know, um, who's going to pay for that? Well, there's really two things. Uh, it could be built into the end product. When seat belts were mandated, consumers had to foot the bill. They're not that expensive, but that's what happened. Or the cost could be subsidized. Governments do that too. Right. They say, we want to move the industry significantly. The cost risk doesn't really work out, but we're going to pay for it for the next X years. And then you're going to be incentivized to change things. Right. Like the SU and pseudo being rewritten in Rust, people are funding this. It's being subsidized, basically. Right. And why do I talk about regulations? It's not theoretical at all. Um, <clears throat> The open source software security mobilization plan is the thing, the White House cybersecurity strategy, the EU Cyber Sec uh, Resilience Act, all touch on the things I just outlined. Right, so ignore the PR problem. I don't care about that. You've got regulations coming for you. Right? So ignore the PR problem. Ignore the ethics problem if you want. Regulations are coming to change stuff. It's going to happen whether you want it or not. Now, it might take a while. It might be responsible in allowing you to change in some way. You could influence people. But like, you know, is C++ worth saving? It's complicated, right? It's not as simple as move to another language, right? Usually when you write software, you add bugs, regardless of what you do. You're always going to add bugs. And so it, it'll take time to mature your new software, whether you rewrite it or write from scratch, right? And <clears throat> the thing to remember as well is there's this concept of a well-trod path that I talked about for functional safety, right? It's the path that you know how to travel, that everyone's traveled. In professional engineering, people do that. C++ is the well-trod path. It has amazing tools. The, it has the engineering know-how. and It's been built over decades. It is the well-trod path. So regardless of if software is new or being updated, the tooling and standards around the well-trod path are really helping C++ stay relevant. And it'll stay relevant for a really long time. Right? C++ is the well-trod path right now. In a safety critical industry, there's things like CERT, like MISRA, like AutoSAR, functional safety standards, processes like ISO 26262, processes like ASPICE. There's tool chains, there's compilers, there's libraries. They're, they're all qualified. And it's industry know-how. The engineers know how to use these tools and maintain all of it. If I wanted to move to another language, it would take a lot of time and a lot of investment. Right? It's really expensive to change this thing. And we know how to do it well. It might not be the most efficient thing, but it works pretty well. So what you need to do is to lower those costs for these other languages to be compelling. And that takes time. It takes time to mature and, and, and for people to benefit from it. So C++ has language maturity, right? Other languages, such as Western Swift, 
they're pretty mature, but they're still kind of in, in their adolescence. Carbon and Val are very much in their infancy. Uh, so is Circle. And, and there's just, they're just not as usable in certain contexts as C++ is, but they're getting better really fast. Right? So developing the equivalent of the C++ ecosystem and C++ users for those languages is going to take a while. But if you look at surveys of like, you know, how, much, how many people use Rust versus C++, Rust is gaining popularity quite a bit. Right? So, so like it's, it's coming, and I think that's good. It's just not just a Rust thing, uh, but like there's other places where things are getting better. So one example is uh, within my company, we're working with Ferrisene to certify Rust for ISO 26262, so for automotive use. And they're, they're pretty close to that. They wrote a whole Rust specification and other stuff around this to get there. Uh, but it's not just about Rust. We're doing this for C++. So we worked with GitHub on improving CodeQL, having Mizra uh, on it. You can like go to GitHub today and use Mizra because we worked with, Code, with uh, GitHub to improve this. So I think we can do things to improve the state of things. It, these are tactical things that we're doing. I think we can have a strategy to invest in things that help everyone have a better C++ and uh, better programming languages at large. So is C++ worth saving? Well, it's here to stay. Right? It, it really is. It's been here for a long time. It'll be here for a long time. I think it's worth saving because it's going to be there for a long time. We can make, make it better. But I also think that stuff like Swift, Rust, Kotlin, TypeScript, they're pretty mature right now. And they have other languages that are less mature coming down that are interesting. Uh, I like programming languages. I think they're worth exploring. But I also think you don't want to have just a, mash, a mishmash of languages in your projects because then they don't interop very well. What you want to have is a bigger framework of programming languages that works for you and that interop pretty well. It's not a new idea. The, there's this paper from 65 called uh, The Next 700 Programming Languages where they advocate for creating 700 programming languages that do little domain-specific things that aren't turn complete that make it easier to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. I think that's another interesting approach, right? In C++, you can write domain-specific languages for your code that makes it more or less impossible to mess up. So you're still using C++, but it has nice properties around it, right? <clears throat> so I don't want to preclude C++, but I think you can use the right tool for the job. C++ is the right tool for many jobs. There's other tools that are becoming better for certain jobs uh, and, and reduce your mental load and things like that. So, did I make a compelling case for saving C++? I wasn't trying to, right? I'm trying to dissect the problem and figure out how we can work together to have safety and security in C++ and in other places. I think C++ is going to be around for a really long time. And so, you know, we have to improve its safety and security. But it doesn't exclude using other languages, right? So given that, what were we going to do? I think what I've outlined is that we can start by acknowledging that we have a problem, right? I think that's important. We can then embrace our ethical responsibilities, uh, get qualified, get better at doing this, getting better people into the standards, quantifying the threat landscape. What does it look like? Understanding the impact on user of de deploying mitigations, and then mitigating the threats incrementally and measuring, having a theory of what it will do when we deploy a thing and seeing if it works out. Yeah. And then working with others beyond the language, right? Hardware operating systems and so on, but also working with like regulators, right? Like I, I think that's something that some of us might be able to do, uh, influence how those regulations are going to make it easier for C++ to thrive in a way that it's more safe and more secure. And then I think it's also useful to explore other languages, right? So I think that's what we're going to do. But what I find difficult when we work on C++ is that pretty often, uh, yeah, we're going to do that. It's like the royal, the anti-royal we, right? It's not the we as in me, the royal we. It's the other people are going to do that, right? So what I want to leave you with is like, what are you going to do, right? I think there's stuff that you can do. And, and you know, if, if you don't do anything, nothing's going to happen. So I think it's important for us to consider what we can do together. So that was my talk. Uh, thank you. And I'll take questions. <laughs> Yeah, do we have microphones or something? Is there a mic runner or something? Or I can repeat the questions. Please go ahead. Um, okay, so uh, uh, first of all, thank you. It's a great talk. Um, I, I think uh, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the train derailed. To, just for the camera, the train derailed, and train of thought went away. Yeah.
write C++ where they had to adopt a new language. It's the kind of massive worldwide code base change that has never happened in history. Like we're not talking about adding seatbelts to cars, we're talking about replacing petroleum with electrical like engines. Like I'm, I'm, I guess I'm concerned that we don't have enough experts in the room about making those kinds of large scale changes when people are having these discussions yeah. about mandates and such. I appreciate that you had some slides about mitigating costs and such, but I feel like the, the strategy is kind of lacking as far as like what's the first step to yeah. so I'll I'll summarize what you're saying by saying seed belts are kind of a point fix. You just add it and then you're done. Whereas software tends to have very interconnected components. It doesn't have a separation of concerns. So addressing one thing sometimes requires pervasive changes in a large part of the ecosystem. And it's hard to consider. Yeah. Yeah so I, I think Yeah so I think John McCall did a really good presentation on how the Apple ecosystem so not just Apple itself but the users are migrating away from C C++ objective C and objective C++ towards Swift right and and doing that at scale you can't just pause the world rewrite everything and then start again that's never going to work right so I would recommend looking at this talk I thought that was a great breakdown of how to do incremental change Yep. And that's great if you're there, but like a lot of all libraries are standing back in other ecosystems, and so they can't just pick that. Solution, yeah. Right? So yeah. I think one of the points you're hitting is that C++ having such a diverse tooling ecosystem, because it was created before standardized tooling ecosystems were a thing, makes it really hard to migrate just anything, because the tooling is just all over the place, right? Like just being able to build a C++ code base, it's really silly, but it's non-trivial. Right, and I think that's a, a huge problem, really hard to fix. I think the tooling group is trying to help, but it's not going to fix everything either. Marshall. Um, I attended a, a talk yesterday about modules, and one of the takeaways from that was modules is going to make tooling much harder. You know, make is going to die. You can't just, if you have modules, you just can't say, make or compile my program. You have to have a, a fairly involved yeah, modules are hard to adopt, but they have a lot of and that's where you advantages. Have a lot of casual programmers. Yeah, it it means that casual programmers have a harder time for sure. So you can't just mandate modules, really. That's what's hard, right? Like there's no like, what's great about new languages, new ecosystems is you're starting from scratch. You've learned from the mistakes of others, and you can fix stuff. And with C plus plus, we have all this baggage dragging us down. Not just that we don't want to change it. But it's actually legitimately hard to change for users if we change it. Like the, the breakage that we can impose on them is really, really tricky. And different users have different levels of, of um, I'm comfort. I'm reacting to your comment about, you know, we have a lot of old tools that are not modern. And I say, mm, that's, it's not an old tools versus modern thing. And gave you an example of something that's very modern yeah. that is going to be a big problem. Yeah, because adoption is tricky. Right, so so I think C++ is worth saving. I'm not saying it's easy. It's really hard. Yeah, train there. So uh, uh, I was really impressed by uh, your comment there early on that C++ is just a tool, and uh, obviously it's a great great tool. But uh, we should use the tools that are, that are, that are best for, for the task that we're, we're ahead of. And I think it's really uh, uh, an, interesting, an interesting, interesting experiment for everyone here uh, to try to look at what they're doing with C++ uh, when, they're, when they're working. Is C++ the right tool for them at the moment? And if so, uh, why? why? What is the superpower of C++? And I wonder if uh, uh, you or the committee or, uh, have tried to uh, also uh, limit or make sure that people use C++ uh, where it's uh, uh, really uh, the, uh, you know, the right tool for the job. Uh, push away uh, like uses that where, where there are other uh, yeah. or build, build bridges between C++ and other languages uh, more proactively such that uh, uh, people can stop using C++. Yeah, so your comment is uh, um, when you use C++ and it's a tool, 
why is it the right tool is the thing we want to think we want to ask and then the committee or the communities can look at what are the right uses for this tool that's C++? And should we try to push away people that are misusing C++, the, the tool it was made for? I think that's really tricky. And uh, I'm going to admit to something. I, 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 I was involved in the creation of WebAssembly, which brought C++ to the web, among other things, um, and Rust and other languages. So like you would think C++ on the web is just a ridiculous idea, but it's not. Right? There's a few key places where it makes sense. But by doing this, I've enabled people to use this tool in places that they really shouldn't as well. And like, it solves issues, right? If you have a giant legacy code base and you want to migrate it to the web, for example, say Lightroom, if you wanted to put Lightroom on the web, C++ in WebAssembly is great for that, right? Yeah. yeah. And Sean worked with us fairly closely to like make that work pretty well, right? He provided feedback to WebAssembly early to make that easier and Photoshop as well. Same thing with video games, right? Like there's giant code bases for Unity and porting Unity to WebAssembly was really easy. Whereas porting that to JavaScript or to Asm.js was very hard, right? So is it the right tool for a new thing to use C++ on the web? I don't think so. Am I going to prevent you from doing that? No. Like Fabrice Bellard, who's a genius, right? W wrote this, this uh, uh, bootloader for, for Linux and JavaScript and then ported it to WebAssembly eventually. You can boot Linux on your, a web page is that a good use of the web? I don't know, right? But like, it's cool. You can do nice stuff with it, right? It sandboxes pretty well. That's cool. You can run a Linux that has completely like sandboxed. But I don't think as a committee, we're really capable of figuring out what the right tools, what the right uses of this tool are, because <clears throat> there's always new uses. Like when we created WebAssembly, uh, one of the bigger, um, uh, groups of people who were interested in using it were crypto people. And I'm, I don't mean cryptography. I mean the other, the bad crypto. I don't like crypto. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sorry, but I don't like it. But it was really interesting because they wanted to use it for uh, smart contracts, which is like we thought about designing WebAssembly for the web, but for non-web uses, for sandboxing stuff. Like you, you've got, it's usable in like CDNs to like steer your traffic, like the, the kind of edge type computing. It's really interesting. We never thought about people using it for smart contracts, yet I look at it. I don't like crypto, but it's a great use of it. If we'd said you can't use WebAssembly for crypto or you can't use C++ for crypto, mm -hmm. is, is that the right thing? I don't know. Like, I think interesting work is being done and people think this is a useful way to spend their time and they do it. So like, I, I think creating technology and saying you can't use it for X or Y is not a great idea. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> uh, another anecdote that we had uh, uh, at dinner a few nights ago was when you, you got Java early on, it said you can't use Java for nuclear uh, power plants. Right? Because Java wasn't designed with functional safety in mind. And you know, they said, well, you can't use it for that. Right? But that's because you have an end user license agreement. Can you put an end user license agreement on an ISO standard? I don't think so. Right? So you can't actually prevent people from doing this. They're going to do it anyways. Maybe we could document. We don't think it's a good use of C++. But I don't know. Like, I don't, like, it's, it's really hard to tell if we're really qualified to make that distinction and if it's a good use of our time also. Yeah, the back. So with all this stuff in mind, what do you think is the responsibility of the C++ committee with these things in regard? And what's the probability that, 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 that those responsibilities will be able to be enacted? So what do I think the responsibility is of the C++ committee? And do I think they'll be enacted? Well, I think. To me, the C++ committee is responsible to put a lot of um, effort towards safety and security. From the survey I've taken, point in time, right? But like from the survey I've taken, a lot of people agree. Uh, I don't know that it'll be enacted. Uh, first, I don't know that everyone agrees, but historically the committee has been very good at discussing a lot of things and making little progress on some of them. It takes a lot of effort to advance things. Uh, I'm fairly hopeful that we'll be able to do that. I really hope we don't do tactical advances. I, like most of the papers I've written on safety and security are purely tactical, right? I think we need a more strategic approach to this. I think that is really hard. I think we might advance on a few tactical things and just not advance on strategic things. And, and that means that C++ will not get significantly better for safety and security over time if we don't do strategy as well as tactics.
Ah. Yeah, so should the committee forego features that do not improve safety and security? Well, it's up to the chairs to decide what gets seen. Uh, and, and I think that's something that we can do. Um, whether national bodies complain if we start doing this, we'll see. I, I think one of my goals as chair of the language evolution is to try to get consensus that this is something that we want to invest in, not just force it onto people, but actually get that consensus. That's why I've tried to do that incrementally in the committee over time. I'd, I'd almost given up like a few years ago. I thought it was, wasn't really working. I'm just going to work on tool chains and do that on the tool chain so people can opt in. Uh, recently, I've tried picking that back up again because I think the committee is changing its mindset. It's not everyone. And I think getting consensus within the committee is going to work. That's one of the reasons I'm here is to kind of lay down what I think we need to do, why, and how we can do it. Because um, if I just force it onto the committee, it's going to get an allergic reaction. I think it's going to be kind of a, a poor approach. I think really getting the consensus is critical. Are we done? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Oh, follow up. Do we know what other ISO working groups are doing? Uh, Robert, what's C doing? <laughs> Robert, next convener of C is saying they're, they're not doing diddly squat. And, and I think C is a very different committee than the C++ committee, uh, but I think they have a similar kind of type of users. If you compare like the Fortran group, the Fortran group, I'm okay if they don't do safety and security. I'm going to venture out and say, by and large, Fortran's not used for that, right? That's okay. COBOL group, probably the same thing. I do think WG23 is doing stuff. I'm not sure it's the right approach, but I think some of it is useful. Uh, so it really depends on the group. And it's not just ISO, it's, it's the other standards bodies. So I, I've been a member of the ECMAScript committee for a while, TC39. I'm not anymore, but I, I've, I've been there for a while. And ECMAScript is the standard for, for JavaScript. And um, <clears throat> for a long time, JavaScript had a lot of exploits in it, a lot. And uh, one of the things that came out of Google Project Zero, actually, is that uh, someone from Project Zero went and presented like kind of excitedly, here's how I break everything you do. And, and that was tremendous. Like she presented this and said like, you did this and then I did that. You did this and then I did that. It's the emergent properties of the standard. Like there's a feature in JavaScript called proxies, which allow you to like wrap a class and intercept anything that goes into it. It's really useful, it's nice to use, but imagine all these dynamic objects and the way it's optimized and having to actually intercept the proxy properly all the time. Like implementations had bugs all over the place, right? And, and that's a kind of recurring theme in a lot of the JavaScript engines. And I think having her present at TC39, it wasn't recorded as far as I know, uh, but uh, it, it had a huge impact on changing how the standards committee operates in terms of how did they standardize features that make implementations more likely to have security issues. Now, I don't think the same thing applies to C++, but I was giving an example earlier of pattern matching being a great way to increase safety and security by being easier to think about and making it harder to create problems. That is not a safety and security feature. It's not, right? It's, it's a language ergonomics feature, but language ergonomics are a great way to get safety and security. Now, does it mean that we should forego all performance improvements to do safety and security? Maybe not. Should we not fix any bugs that aren't security? If you know, it's, it's a really tricky trade-off. All right. One hand there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question is on, on safety and correctness being different, and can uncorrectness, uh, can last lack of correctness cause safety issues? Um, and, and the way it's approached in, in functional safety is that, you know, I, I described safety as being meeting the requirements, and the requirements are defined in terms of uh, uh, preventing uh, 
particular types of failure. Right? And so preventing those failures doesn't mean you can operate the vehicle correctly, but it might mean that if this failure happened or is going to happen, you can't operate the vehicle anymore. Now, the vehicle might be incorrect, but it's actually preventing you from doing something unsafe. Right? So if a vehicle, for example, I don't know, like uh, um, runs out of, of, of some fluid or something, or has a very small amount, could still run. But the, the, the a requirement might be if there's less than this, you can't run anymore because you're going to start to drive and then it's unsafe. Right? Now, it's incorrect in the sense that I could have driven to the, the supermarket and back or to, to the car shop and back. Right? But it's arguably safer. And so it's really like the distinction I want to make here is that correctness is really you as your use as a user your implicit requirements that you put on the the operation of the system they're not formalized requirements it's just your expectation of what it means to work correctly whereas to me type safety and memory safety and thread safety and functional safety are formal requirements or needs to be formal requirements on the operation of the system that are met by that system right so that's a distinction it, in a way, correctness is a different spec that's completely informal and that's completely in your mind, right? And so that, that's a distinction I want to make. Like, it, it might not do what you want, but it still does something. Yeah, I think we need to wrap up. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up, but we should talk afterwards. Thank you, everyone.